The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everybody. This is Josh Hallman from Vermont Forest Parks and Rec. Um, welcome to our third installment of the Vermont Virtual Forest Health Meeting webinar series. Um, yeah, hopefully uh, all the sounds working and everybody can hear everything okay today. Um, again, I want to thank uh, Kate Four and UVM Extension for providing uh, the GoToWebinar service for us and helping us with all the logistics on this. It's been a great help. Um, if you've attended these in the past couple of weeks, you're familiar with my whole spiel here, but I'll go through it again for those who are new to the webinar series. Um, we do offer credits for this webinar. Uh, we have uh, SAF, CFEs, um, we have ISA credits as well as pesticide applicator credits that are available um, for this. Hopefully you indicated that on the registration link. Um, and in order to get those credits, uh, there is a survey at the very end of the webinar today that will come up on your screen as you close out of the app um, that should link to the questions that are required in order to get especially the pesticide credits. Um, so fill, please fill those out so that we can get you those credits. If you do not have that pop up on your screen, uh, there should be an email that comes your way shortly after the webinar that will uh, provide the same survey so that you can get those credits. Um, let's see, the, as most folks know, um, these webinars will ultimately be available on demand through the R Vermont Woods uh, website. Um, I'll be sending out an email uh, today with some more details on that. I think I promised that last week, but that'll come out today with an update on when those webinars will be available. Currently, uh, there are webinars on the website there, but they are not ready for, um, for viewing in order to get credit. We hope that that will be available starting May 15th, uh, that at that point, you will be able to go to the website. We'll have a direct link for you. You can view the webinars and after that, um, take the survey and still get credits for it, even if you're not viewing the webinar live. So that's great news. And um, as I mentioned, I'll have an email going out today uh, with an anticipated date of that starting on May 15th. Um, let's see, other logistics for today. Uh, if you've not used GoToWebinar before, on the right-hand side, there is this, what we call a dashboard. Um, it has an, a number of dropdowns. There's a questions dropdown. And for, for any questions that you have for either of the talks today, we have two of them that it's gonna split the time. Um, please put those in the uh, questions box. And at the very end of the webinar, I will compile those and ask the presenters those questions. Um, so feel free to fill that in and uh, they'll be asked those at the very end of the webinar today. Um, I think that's it as far as logistics go for this one. Uh, so today we have two speakers. We have John Cherico from Vermont Department of Forest Parks and Recreation and Jim Duncan from the Forest Ecosystem Monitoring Cooperative. Um, John's gonna lead us off today and he's gonna talk about uh, some tools for the field, specifically Avenza Maps, which some of you may use in your daily work. Um, I use it occasionally, um, but definitely don't know all the ins and outs. So I'm really looking forward to that. And uh, Jim will be talking about some of the tools that FEMC has developed over the years um, and most recently, a, a couple new tools um, that are probably of particular interest to foresters. So uh, really looking forward to these two talks today. Um, this is about an hour webinar. We're going to try and leave 10 minutes for questions at the end. Um, but without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and pass this over to John and uh, let him get going on a talk about Avenza. So thanks, John. All right. Thank you so much, Josh. I appreciate it. Um, yeah. So as Josh said, I'm going to be talking about Avenza Maps. And without further ado, I'll just roll right into it. So obviously, when you're outside working in the woods on different people's property, maybe first time out somewhere, knowing where you are matters. Uh, that seems very like blunt and obvious, but it does. Um, whether it's, like I said, property boundaries or sensitive areas or maybe just unique geologic features like a random drop coming up on you, you want to know where you are and what, what's nearby. Um, and, you know, we've had methods change over time with how we do this, but really the goal is to carry less and be more accurate. So um, looking at some of the tools that have allowed us to do this over time, we, we see it kind of get smaller, less heavy, more efficient, starting with, you know, maybe throwing a chain. If you, if you started a while ago, that might have been the first way you were doing it, moving on to a more standard compass and pacing maybe, or using a topo map with your compass. Um, I know when I started, I was using 
something like this Garmin handheld unit that's the third picture here. I still have one of these, and quite frankly, I haven't even plugged it in or used it in the last two years because of this fourth picture here, which is just a phone with the Venza Maps on it. Um, for all intents and purposes, it's been more useful and just as accurate for me with while carrying less weight um, than having an extra GPS unit with me. So what is Avenza? Basically, it's an app for Android and Apple products with three different versions, a free, plus, and pro version. And what it does, it allows you to download customer pre-made maps that, to navigate outside of cell service, basically overlaying you on top of whatever map you're looking at. Um, the versions come with different costs, obviously, and features. So the free version, you get three maps you can have on your phone at any time, and you can pick whatever three maps you want. The plus version gives you unlimited maps and a few more features than you get with the free version, uh, some exporting abilities. And the pro version uh, basically gives you everything that Avenza has to offer, being able to export shapes into GIS and shape files very easily. Uh, it allows some more geospatial calculations to occur. Let's use, uh, do some more work. So um, the price is, like I, I believe I said, free. Plus is $30 a year and Pro is $130 a year, but you can get a discounted rate for some sort of enterprise deal where they've reduced the rate based on number of accounts. So without holding on any more on descriptions, let's get into what you can do with Avenza. And you're about to see a lot of screenshots, so bear with me. It's, you know, giving a presentation on an app kind of just requires a lot of pictures of a phone screen. So we're gonna be working through them bit by bit. So positioning, this is, the most basic and important part of this app. Otherwise, it wouldn't really be that great. Um, it lets you know where you are. So I'm going to try and use this laser pointer here. Basically, in this bottom left-hand corner here, you have this little arrow. If you tap that, your screen will hone right in on what the blue dot, which is where you are. So with that, you also get your exact coordinate, which will be given at the bottom of the screen here. And you can then copy that, share it, do a whole suite of tools or uh, different things with that. Additionally, if you tap that same button again, it'll actually rotate the map around to show which way you are facing relative to the map and give your, your uh, direction that you're facing. So in this case, at my house here, I'm, I'm at 171 degrees uh, I'm facing. And as I were to move, this map would rotate with me. So it just, it gives me a pretty good understanding of say, I wanna walk to this little island here on the river, I would just have to rotate left a little bit and walk completely straight or follow this road down and over. And as I move, the map will move with me, not just rotation based, but actual position on the map will move along. Um, place marks. So this is something I find myself using pretty frequently with the Venza. Um, basically, what you can do is find any point on the map, put your crosshairs over it by dragging or along with your finger and pressing this little pin icon here and you can give different titles, change the color. Sorry for my red green colorblind folks here, but this pin here is red, this pin here is green. I gave them different names just to show that you can. And then you can even switch away from pins and do different icons. So in this case down here, I just picked a fictional spot on the river, that same island, called it a fishing hole. And basically by clicking this info little button right here, you get all the, this information that you can edit. You can change the title, change the symbol, you can georeference a photo, so you can take a picture there and it'll be tied to that pin location for what you're seeing. Uh, you can fill in a description for what you saw, and once again, it will give you those coordinates and the time that you made that pin. So all this is really useful for, say you're out somewhere and you see something unique and you wanna have a picture of it, maybe it's, you know, if you're doing uh, acceptable management practices and you see something that doesn't look right, taking a picture, marking it, giving a description and when you were there. And you can change any information you want. You can export these by hitting that little icon there to share it with other people. So it, it's, it just lets you do a lot, it's great. Um, moving on to tracks. So if you click on or tap on this little three dot icon in the bottom right of your, of your pane there, then you get this option to record GPS tracks. And if you've used the handheld GPS before, then you've probably done this. And it just allows you, as you're walking, to have a path form below, before, uh, behind you as you walk. It just shows the distance you've traveled and the same sort of information that you had for a pinpoint you can do with uh, a track. So you can change the color, the thickness of the line. It gives you uh, information in this case. Let's see. It'll give you uh, total moving time, track length, average speed, minimum and maximum elevations, the elevation gains at different points. So 
In this case, I went from where I live with my dog down to Stone's Throw Pizza at 1030 in the morning, which sounds like a total quarantine thing to do. But um, so I did that. And it lets me know that in this case, it was a 0.58 mile trip and it took 17 minutes and 58 seconds. And I titled it Dog Walk. I could then stop that track and then export it and share it with someone if I wanted, or just have it saved on my map so I can remember the path I took. Uh, calculations. So this allows you to measure the distance of line segments or and essentially determine the, the path length without actually walking it or driving it or navigating it. So let's say I wanted to walk from where I am down to this fishing hole down here. I could tap that draw and measure button from that same three dot little icon in the bottom of the pane, and then just tap my way along the road path I would take to get over to this fishing hole. And I'll see that it's 1.31 miles. And maybe I'll say, ah, I wanna get there sooner rather than later. And I don't wanna carry all that gear. So I'm gonna drive instead. I can do that. You could also do it if you had Google Maps going, but say you're out of cell service, you'd still be able to do this effectively. And now you can have that path saved and you could give it the same information you would like anything else that we've talked about pinpoints and all that and export to someone else to show your favorite path down there or whatever it might be. Uh, additionally, you can change the units. So right now it's in miles, but I could uh, tap, I believe it's the description icon right here, or no, it's actually this little slider here and I could change that to feet, meters. You could even create your own units. So if you wanted to know exactly how many chains, just to be funny with it, you could totally create your own unit of chains and then reference it to equal 66 feet and that would be no problem. Um, so it's, I found this most useful uh, in a more practical setting would be if I'm cruising timber and I want to know how far away I am from the next place I need to be, I'll just draw a segment from where I am to that next uh, dot on my map and I'll know, okay, I've got another 200 feet till I'm there or 500 feet or whatever it may be. All right, so more calculations. This is a, a very useful tool as well that allows you to basically draw and measure the same way we did that line segment, except you tap this little shape down here that I highlighted in red, and you can just tap a polygon and it will give you the perimeter of that as well as the area within it. And you can save that shape and export it as well. So in this case, the shape I made, which I didn't give a title, it's just called area one, um, has an area of 20 acres and a perimeter of 0.73 miles. So uh, you could think of that, whether it's you know, a leaf tree area or a sensitive area to avoid, or if you see invasives in an area, you could quickly walk around it and get a perimeter, save it, export it, that sort of deal. And you'll have the exact information for what uh, you're mapping. And it's just, makes things a lot easier than trying to estimate it based on what you're looking at. Uh, coordinates, so this is another cool thing you can do where, so say I am at the top of this hill that I'm pointing at over here. I could then take my coordinates in Avenza, which would be from copying it down in this area here. I could text somebody else who has Avenza. They would receive a text with that. So in this case, the coordinates for this hilltop here are 44.412, blah, blah, blah. I could text that to someone, they could copy it, go to find my coordinates in that same pane down here, type it into the top and Avenza will put you right there. And then you could set a pin or navigate to that point, uh, measure distance between all the other tools we've talked about. So it's very useful if you know the coordinates of something beforehand or you wanna see where the exact coordinates of something are, you can just copy it in, paste it, and Avenza will show you where that is on your map. Oh, and another thing, all of these USGS maps are totally free in the Avenza store. Uh, overlapping, as far as I know, the entire state of Vermont, I'd imagine they're everywhere. Um, so I didn't have to pay anything or make this map. I just found it in the Avenza store, which actually has a geo-referenced store. So you could look at what maps overlap your area and add those to your phone. All right, opening Google Maps. I didn't know about this one until I actually was making this presentation and looking at the different tools down here. I've never used it before until yesterday, and it actually works really well. So what this allows you to do is transfer whatever you're looking at on your phone screen in Avenza to Google Maps. But for this to work, you do have to have cell service or Wi-Fi or, or some sort of connection. But in my case, yesterday I was hiking around in an area I wasn't super familiar with. Uh, I was actually up uh, the VYCC trails and I got up to a viewpoint and I didn't see where my truck was parked from there. So I wondered, oh, where am I relative to where I'm parked? I was able to tap this open view in Google Maps and then I can see my position 
and I could see where the, the barn that I had parked my truck at was, and I was able to know that I wasn't that far away and hike my way back down. So beneficial if you have cell phone service, uh, but you know, probably not gonna be used every day, but in a pinch if you're kind of messing around and need to see something nearby, whether it's a house or a parking lot or any other features, water body, then it, it's good to know. Um, airdrop, so this is one that people are using a little more now. It's kind of uh, been popular out west for wildfire responses. I've used it when dealing with contractors before, passing a map onto them for, or a boundary of a pre-commercial thin unit, something like that. Um, in this case, this is a demo we were doing in Chester for a wildfire class. We basically had a fictional fire and I just on the fly very quickly made some features while I was out there, including a safety zone, trailhead, medevac area, and then this polygon here is the actual fire that we walked the perimeter of and calculated an area, and this orange line is the path we took to get in there. So if I wanted to share this with someone who's just showing up on the scene to respond to a fire, and I have an Apple product and they have an Apple product, I can airdrop it directly to them, which basically means no cell service required, no internet, no nothing, just two phones next to each other. You could drop it from one phone to the next. You would hit this export icon, which is gonna be down here, um, it allows you to export everything or you can export just specific features and basically as long as that other phone is set up to receive airdrops you could be able to tap on their icon and then going from this iPad here to this phone here you have it and it took less than 30 seconds it was just boom right there so this works well for iPhone products Apple products obviously but if you have Android devices you can't airdrop but you can still share it it just requires cell service or a connection of some sort whether it's tethering or Wi-Fi uh, driving. So uh, this is another great feature that we actually just used this last winter and in, in fall sort of time doing our uh, Emerald Ash 4 roadside surveying. So if in this case we recorded tracks as we drove around an area and it just allows us to record routes we've driven for surveying or trips or anything like that and what it allows us pretty much is the ability to make sure that we aren't driving over the same area twice. We know how many uh, miles of road we covered in a day we can see areas we missed. We can make sure that coworkers don't go back to where we already were. And along these routes, we could place pins if we see something suspicious or that doesn't look quite right, anything like that. And you can change the colors. In this case, I've got the blue route was one day, I believe the first day we went out and this green route was the second day. So we were able to cover these two different areas and then export this and make a map that shows where across the state at all of our protection foresters were looking for an old ash borer. And it just allows us to kind of piece a better picture together very quickly. And it gives us basic information such as, as we discussed, miles driven, elevation change, all of that time spent driving, all anything. And you can pause the track at any time and keep going. Um, so it it's really helpful just to visualize what we're doing as opposed to maybe uh, trying to follow along on a gazetteer or something like that. Uh, but speaking of road atlases and gazetteers, uh, you can also use your Avenza app pretty much as a GPS outside of cell service with this free map offered by uh, the Avenza store that was made by VTrans. So this is called Vermont Highways. It's a totally free map that, that's in that app store or Avenza map store, I should say. And this is the fully zoomed out version of it. In this first screenshot here, I took the screenshot while my fingers were pinched all the way tight as I could to zoom it out. And then fully zoomed in here is the same map. So the resolution of it's pretty great. And what I would do in this situation is either have a co-pilot with me showing me uh, or telling me where to turn or which way to drive, or I would have this, my phone mounted onto a GPS mount on my dashboard and have my screen set to stay on at all times, not go to sleep. And I could just navigate as I go. And like we said, if you were to tap this icon here, this little arrow in the corner, the, the screen would actually turn with you as you're driving and making turns. So it allows you to kind of see where you're going as you go. Um, and that's great if you're in a pinch somewhere like, I don't know, maybe the Northeast Kingdom where you don't have cell service, so you can't use Google Maps and you need to get out of some area you're not super familiar with and get back towards a major road until you can, you know, find your way to cell service and navigate out. And like I said, this map is completely free. Uh, so getting into some of the practical applications of Avenza, I've kind of covered it as I went, but just kind of lining it up again as we wrap up here. You can maybe delineate sensitive areas or you know, if it's a small stand, you could do that. I wouldn't want to walk the perimeter of a 200 acre stand, but if you were really 
feeling it, you could. Uh, you could mark logging activities. Maybe it's water bars as you're going, tracks for skid trails, log landings, uh, patch cut perimeters to determine acres that are actually being harvested and what's being left behind. Um, I use this most prevalently at my last job for doing forest inventories and timber cruises. Uh, I, in one year with that last company I worked for, I cruised about 6,000 acres or one plot for every three acres. And the way I would get audited is every point I cruised, I would put a piece of flagging at plot center and a piece of flagging at my first tree. And I would be navigating out to a point on the map, similar to what you're seeing here, these dots. I would just use a Benza to navigate to them and put a point in there. And anyone who was auditing me would use that same map in a Benza to get out to my point and look for my flagging. And not once did I have a missing uh, plot that wasn't found. So uh, in terms of on the ground application, it's plenty accurate. It gets you where you need to be. And um, people are able to find your work if you're sharing it with them. They are going to be sent 50 feet off in the wrong way or 200 feet off in the wrong way. Um, but again, because it's based off phone GPS, you have to you know, not be navigating with you know, your phone in a metal box or something like that. So let's be able to get, you know, satellite. Uh, additionally, you can identify trails and roads, not on maps. This is something that I found useful when you're walking through the woods and maybe there's some old abandoned trail out there, some old path, and you find out it's a shortcut. You can uh, run your tracks as you're going in that way. And then when you're leaving the woods for the day, you can go, oh yeah, I had that track over here, that old trail, and you can find it and get your way out. Um, additionally, like I said, you can determine acre, acres burned by a wild or prescribed fire after the fact or during. If you keep a safe enough distance, you can quickly walk around the perimeter while recording a track, and then you could have that shared out and say, okay, we had 30 acres burned in this fire, or five acres burned, or it was only half an acre, that sort of deal. Um, and just being able to quantify things like that is really helpful in the grand scheme of things. So wrapping it up, events is completely free, but you get what you pay for. Basically, with that free version, you're, you're getting three maps at a time. You can delete another app, map and add one on, but it's still useful. I, I use the free version of events on my personal phone if I don't want to carry around my work phone during the day, on a weekday, weekend or something like that. Um, I'm sure I only listed a few of the applications for it, but there are whatever you can think to do with it, you can give it a shot and see if it works for you. Uh, I kind of like to argue that it is one less tool to carry at the end of the day, so why not give it a shot? Uh, if you really are skeptical of it, carry your handheld GPS with you or do it the old way, but keep a Benza running at the same time. And at the end of the day, you'll see it's it's just as effective, if not more effective, not to fumble around with another tool. And I, I personally love doing it in this era of newer phones. The, the water resistance is there. You, you don't have as much damage from drops. Uh, like I said, I was working on very steep, rough terrain at my last job, just using Avenza maps and uh, raining probably nine months out of the year in coastal Oregon. And I didn't have one issue with my phone or the battery of my phone dwindling down too much using Avenza. It was really useful and uh, I recommend it to anyone. And I think that's why Josh asked me to give this presentation is because of how much I talk about Avenza and how great it is. So um, I really do recommend it to anyone who's looking to give it a shot. It's definitely worth it to me. And that's what I got. So uh, I think we'll save questions for the end and it's probably gonna go to Jim next. So thank you everybody. Thanks, John, really appreciate that. Um, yeah, I'm gonna pass it off to Jim right now. And uh, as John mentioned, we will be doing questions at the end. So continue to fill that box in. Um, but for now, I'm gonna pass it over to Jim Duncan from FEMC. Great, thank you, Josh, and thanks, John, for an awesome presentation to kick this off. Um, I'm Jim Duncan, I'm the Director for the Forest Ecosystem Monitoring Cooperative, and today I'm gonna to be talking about the uh, some of our tools for understanding trends in forest ecosystems that FEMC has been developing over the year. Uh, specifically today, uh, I'm gonna to focus on uh, two uh, of our longer standing tools, the Vermont Forest Indicators Dashboard, and the Northeastern Forest Health Atlas, and some of the ways you could use these to get some uh, situational awareness and context around what's happening in our forests in the region. Um, and if there's time at the end, I have a sneak peek that I would like to share. So I'll start out with the Vermont Forest Indicators Dashboard. Uh, this is a product that provides current year scores and long-term trend analysis and 34 indicators of forest condition broadly in the state. 
and it lets people find high-level summaries with underlying data, methods, additional interpretation. Uh, the idea is to let people start in uh, broad and zero in on the kind of content and information they're interested in. So why even do a dashboard? Um, we were trying to answer this question, which I think all of us think about on a fairly regular basis, how are Vermont's forests doing? And as soon as you start to think about how to answer that question, you're thinking about things such as structure and condition of the forest, how that system is being stressed and responding to stress, and what are the services that we're getting out of uh, the forests? Because it might be fine to have the forests existing as they are, but what are they also providing back to us in terms of recreation or uh, economic value? Each of these is pretty complex. Uh, there's a lot of data and information and knowledge that goes into understanding what's happening within any one of these categories, let alone overall. So we wanted to create this easy to use scorecard for our forests that uh, can be useful for decision makers, planners, educators, to have a, a simple way to get into some pretty complex processes. This is my one of my favorite graphs to look at. Uh, it shows the difference of extent versus timing versus number of damage uh, years for certain agents in Vermont. But this is pretty difficult to interpret until you spend some time with it. So we wanted to provide context and integration of that information so that people aren't left with this nice graph that they can't figure out what to do with. So we built the Forest Indicators dashboard, working with a number of experts in the state to try and rate these different categories um, and give some overall information. So when people land, when you come to the site, you'll see this. Uh, you can assess uh, a category. We talked about structure and condition, stressors and services. It provides the latest year score. So for the most recent year of data, how are we doing overall? And it provides these long-term trend indicators. So are things improving or getting worse over time uh, in each of these indicators and in this overall category? Clicking on a condition, uh, you'll see an overview of what we mean by forest condition. And it provides a score for that category. And you also see the data sets or the indicators that go into that and how they're weighted. So these are the sets of uh, metrics that we're using to calculate condition in the forest in Vermont. And finally, this overview of the category, and if you scroll down, some more information on each of these indicators about how we're quantifying this condition. So first stepping in, you can see how are we doing in forest condition and how are we deciding what that means. If you're in, then digging further to this information, we provide uh, some overview summaries of each of those indicators. So here we've clicked on crown dieback. And we can see the score for 2018, which is our most recent data year at the time the screenshot was taken, is a 3.1 out of 5. Um, so that, uh, if you look at the graph of data down below, that's showing the percent dieback in the canopy uh, on a series of long-term plots in the state, um, which has been increasing in recent years. And we've also provided the long-term trend, and it's significantly getting worse. So we're seeing more dieback in the crown. Uh, so the scores are going down over time. Even though the data is going up, the scores go down because we're getting farther away from where we want to be. And we're seeing this decline in some of the, our long-term plots. And finally, we provide this graph of data so that people can actually view the data. Uh, we're going to be adding the scores too so people can see both the scores and the data side by side um, in the near future. Looking at a couple of other uh, indicators, since this is a forest health webinar series, I uh, focused in on a couple of other data sets that we've included here. This is forest damage. So this is from aerial mapping of uh, damage agents in the forest. And we can see that uh, in this data set, we're looking for some sort of uh, mean. Uh, so we're not departing too far from historical norms. Uh, we're doing pretty well in that respect. So we're close to a score of five for our latest data. And the long-term trend is no real increase or decrease in those scores over time. When we look instead at mortality, uh, we see pro pretty much the same picture. We've had these spikes and dips over time, but where we are now is pretty close to where we've been over the 20 plus year record for this data set. So the scores are doing pretty well. Taking a look at what services we get out of the forest, as an example, I've looked here at forest bird diversity. Um, so we took a set, a set of um, about a dozen sites from the Vermont Center for Eco Studies and forested sites representative of our state's forests and looked at the species diversity index over time. And we do see some uh, statistically significant declines in that diversity score over time. 
So this is uh, an indication that there uh, is potentially something about Vermont's forests that are harming forest bird diversity, but also, of course, these could be migratory birds that are responding to stresses in their overwintering grounds. But as an indicator of how our forests are doing at providing biodiversity as a service, this is one indicator where we might have some concern. And thinking about stresses on our system, we looked at climate extremes. Uh, this is a great data set developed by the uh, NOAA to go back to 1910, um, and it looked at extreme events uh, as a kind of composite metric. And we do see this, um, it looks like it's increasing, but the statistics show us that it's still too variable to know. But we're um, seeing that in the last couple of years, we've been above the long-term mean for climate extreme surfing and departure, which is kind of the story we hear pretty often. So this uh, dashboard is integrating all these pieces of information. Of course, what we all want to know is how can I find out more? We do provide a lot of information, this one little I button up on the top, so you can get more information about the dashboard as a whole. You can access methods for each individual metric that's in there, and uh, the data sets that go into it are also available on those individual indicator pages. And we also track versions over time so that as we make these regular updates to data, if you've looked at a dashboard, say, a couple of years ago or even last month, and we then make a data update, you can go back and get the original version that you were looking at at the time. So we have these uh, version tracking to make it easier to uh, make sure that you're looking at the same thing, or if you think something changed, you can find out why. And very soon, we're going to be adding some nice new features to this. Uh, we've been gathering expert interpretation on the trends, so not just saying it's going up or going down, but why is it? What might be something we could do that could change that direction? Uh, we're providing these downloadable one-page flyers uh, for each indicator, so if you want to grab something to print out to take uh, with you to the field or to a meeting or to an advocacy session, you have access to that. And uh, we'll be expanding the indicator category pages to include scores and data and just providing a little bit more user-friendly information on some of these pages. Um, thinking about how this could be useful, uh, we really see this as having a different use for different audiences. But we think for maybe some of the work that you're doing, Providing context can be really helpful. These are statewide indicators. You can't drill down to a single parcel or a single town, but you can look at where we are as a state. And then with that information and your expert knowledge, you can take that and say, how can this project, this property, this plan uh, help fix what isn't going well or support what is working and tell that story to a landowner or a stakeholder so they understand where their property and their plan fits in the larger picture for forests in our state and what we're trying to do. And then we also just generally have a tool to more broadly engage the public about what forests are doing for us in the state. So I think we can focus on the kind of structural pieces in our own professional circles, but thinking about the services that forests are providing and how much uh, value we're getting out of that. This is a way to communicate what is and isn't working in Vermont forests. And uh, we get use, easy to use visual summaries that can provide that information and regularly updated content. Uh, so that it's fresh and something that is worth checking on a regular basis as we continually add data. Shifting to the Northeastern Forest Health Atlas is a second tool that I wanted to cover today. Uh, this is a tool that provides access to decades of uh, aerial survey data on mortality and defoliation. Uh, I mentioned that data set previously in the indicators dashboard. We also uh, have compiled a much longer historical record and for the whole region here in the Northeastern Forest Health Atlas. And this has a slightly different use. You can quickly create maps, charts, tables um, that are tailored to your places, pests, damage causing agents, and dates of interest in the region. So when you land on the atlas, you end up here. And this is a primarily a map-based interface to explore these polygons of damage and some of these points that show research sites. So the uh, biggest power of this is to be able to quickly filter down to what you're interested in. This map in and of itself is fun to look at, but it has more utility if you can get to what you are interested in. So you can limit the uh, display to certain types of insects and diseases uh, using a simple text search. You can choose what damage types you wanna show. So if you only wanna look for mortality, you can, um, if you want to look for uh, defoliation or all types of damages, you can select what you want to do there. 
um, you can limit by the year or the state. We have data going back to 1918 from Maine in here. I think in Vermont it goes back to 1985 now and it will go back to 1965 fairly soon. So there could be up to 50 years of Vermont data um, housed here. And you can just limit down to Vermont if you want to. And some of the other pieces on the right that you'll see, we show how much aerial survey data there is. And we also provide access to research projects. Um, the idea was to give you the locations of field-based sites. So if you're interested in looking at how an on-the-ground study quantified beach bark disease compared to what you're seeing from the air of the impacts of beach bark disease, we have the ability to link those research and monitoring data sets through the Forest Health Atlas. Looking just at Vermont, um, this go shows a little walkthrough. I have to apologize about using a web-based tool in a webinar setting. Um, so I can't show you this on in live, live uh, action, but if you were to kind of go to this interface limit to Vermont, you can see, oops, uh, you can see the users already selected Forest Tent Caterpillar up here on the top. And you can see the uh, users also started typing in beach and it's popping up two different codes that appear in the US Forest Service definition so they can search for beach bark disease. Um, they've limited the time from 2000 to 2018, even though there's already there's data back to 1945. Um, and so the user then clicks on the bottom to apply the map and the result is this filtered product. So here you're seeing all polygons of damage that are uh, from either forest tent caterpillar or beach bark disease in this time. And this gives you access to maps, charts, and downloads and tables, uh, all based on these filters that you're setting. So you can see how much uh, damage has been done by those two agents over time. On the left, in the middle, you can access uh, the actual data. So you can download corresponding research data, the actual aerial survey data, um, or maps as images. And you can also get this view in graph form. Here I've shown it by agents. So forest and caterpillar uh, damaging more than beach bark disease as visible from the air during this time period. So if I were instead to think about a different set of agents, I might be interested instead in comparing forest and caterpillar and gypsy moth. Here I've set the filters on the right to those two agents and you can't see it, but I expanded out to include the entire region so we have uh, this showing it by frequency extent, how many years that agent was detected in the region was 19 for gypsy moth and 18 for forest tent. Uh, more total area damaged by a gypsy moth and the maximum area mapped in a year was 193,000 acres um, has been mapped for gypsy moth versus only 159 for forest tent. So you can compare those two agents in this table form. And this is to show that as you're exploring in the table, you also are propagating those changes to the map. So as uh, if you were to switch back to the map view, this is showing all of that damage that we've uh, that has been recorded in this tool. But you can't really tell what the difference is between forest tent and gypsy moth. Um, so we have this ability to adjust legends and base maps. You can switch to satellite view or uh, change the legend options. So here, if you were to click on uh, the legend options by damage agent, you can see where forest tent has been prevalent versus where gypsy moth is. Probably not surprising to see those distributions, but you can show agents in different colors as well. And the nice thing about this type of view is the darker the color, the more times that that uh, damage has been recorded in that area. So you can see some of the hot spots already that pop out in uh, Massachusetts and Rhode Island for gypsy moth uh, defoliation mortality. Uh, for certain species of interest, we actually have provided an analysis of how these repeat damages occurred over time. So if you were to switch to, oh, sorry, I should say about sharing first. Um, the nice thing about this too is you can actually share an exact map link. So if you were to copy the URL or click on the share button, you can get a link that you can send to someone else or save for yourself for later that will recreate this exact display again. So you don't have to come back in here and set all your filters. You can share a single URL that will give you back exactly what you have uh, that you're seeing here. So it makes it easy to share with others um, and not having to provide instruction on first click this, then click that. We've also provided these analysis of repeat damages. Um, so if you were to click on uh, the pre-made maps link up here, you'll get a list of a couple that were of interest to some of our partners. 
uh, winter moth, forest and caterpillar, gypsy moth. Um, this is showing uh, all the repeat damages for gypsy moth. So whenever um, areas overlapped with any type of damage, it records a number of years. You can't see the full legend, but you do have some high uh, repeat damage areas here in central Mass and in southeastern Massachusetts. So you can see where hot spots of certain types of um, damages have been over time. And for Massachusetts, this data goes back to uh, the 1930s. So you have a pretty good record of kind of gypsy moth impacts over the long term in that state. You could look at just defoliation. So this is northern Vermont near uh, Newport. Um, so this shows you the number of years that there's been any sort of defoliation. And this kind of comes into where uh, we think this could be helpful for some of the work you do. It does provide historical perspective. So what stressors have affected a particular spot in the past and what has happened nearby. So there might be some site context and awareness that you can access pretty quickly if you're going to an area and you want to see what the disturbance and um, damage history, at least from the visible from the sky, has been. You can access that uh, context awareness there. And it also provides ready-to-go products. So these maps and tables um, are all downloadable. You can get the pictures of the charts. You can download the table data to work with in Excel. You can download the spatial data or download the data, the spatial data as a table if you want to work with it that way. So you can access whatever level of information you need for analysis or to insert in documentation um, from the site pretty easily. And I didn't talk about this too much uh, because it's not something that's been as emphasized in the Forest Health Atlas, but this connection to academic and research studies is something that's pretty uh, new for this type of monitoring work. So we're actually trying to link together better what field sites we have around the region that um, speak to any of these types of damage agents, whether it's drought or uh, weather damage or invasive insects. Um, these studies on the ground could really help pair with and, and inform the monitoring and vice versa. So those um, access to academic studies can be a, a quick entry to something that otherwise is kind of hard to find. So I, have, I do have enough time to do a little bit of a sneak peek. Um, I'd hoped this would be ready for this webinar, but we're still doing a little bit of work on another product that I wanted to share that I thought might be of interest to this group. Um, the Northeastern Forest Regeneration Data Network is an effort we've been working on for about a year and a half to build a clearinghouse of information about how people are collecting forest regeneration data. There's a lot of interest in this at the regional scale because of issues of deer browse impact, uh, climate change potentially changing how uh, species are regenerating on the forest floor, and other impacts that could lead to changes in our forest. And as we started to look at this issue, there's clearly a lack of uh, centralization or ability to get a good amount of information from one place about all these different efforts. There's groups doing some methods in New York and then groups doing other methods on Harvard Forest. How do we make it easier to assess what's being done at the regional scale, find methods that work, and compare different programs so we can get a better understanding of what's happening with forest regeneration in the region? So this isn't live yet on the web, um, but this, these are shots of our development site that I wanted to share with you. Uh, so this is going to be a table and map-based explorer to understand the distribution of these programs. Um, the uh, table provides comparisons of how studies can be used. So a dark green circle um, in this case shows that it is uh, completely comparable or able to be compared. So for seedling analysis on this project, you can use it to compare density of seedlings because the right kind of data was collected. So if you're thinking about trying to put together data sets from a number of studies, you could uh, look for these dark green circles. Light green means you might have to make some assumptions and yellow means they didn't collect the type of data you would need to be able to assess these impacts. You can assess browse for seedlings in this case. You can click on this to get more details on the project, like who the contact was, uh, access to the data sets if that they're available, uh, descriptions, the species that they're monitoring through these programs. And you can also filter down studies. And this is probably where we see the most value in this is that you can uh, more quickly find studies that are matching your criteria. So if you're interested in sapling uh, mortality or sapling browse impacts, you can really dial into which studies are doing this. If you have a time frame you're interested in or a certain elevation range, you can pull out those uh, studies that 
are done to match your needs. And once you've started to identify the sets of studies that uh, are of interest, you can compare different programs. Uh, so this is showing a kind of comparison. It's kind of like a shopping cart you've put. You've got three programs you're interested in. You want to see how CFI in Vermont, Baxter State Park, and Maine Natural Areas uh, CFIs compare to each other for regeneration. We've assessed nearly seven programs in over 100 categories um, to be able to compare these programs together. So you can look across uh, to see what their seedling plot size was or if they had a seedling plot. You can look at other metrics such as saplings or general metadata and you can download the program methods. So you'll be able to grab a PDF that lists all this data or that lists the, all this information for all three programs. Um, and this could be really helpful for if you're thinking about implementing a regeneration uh, method in a program or play a plan or a plot network, you could look at how others are doing it, um, how much information their particular method can provide, and thus think about how much effort you want to expend um, in order to have something that's comparable with what others are doing. So this might be a way to think about how to not only collect data that you actually need, but also collect data in a way that will uh, mesh well with what else is being done in the region. So this program, as I mentioned, it's not there yet, but it's out in the coming weeks. Uh, we'll be having a more uh, detailed dive into the information and data that's available. So if you're interested, sign up for our listserv. That's where we announce these types of efforts um, on Forest Regeneration Data Network. So between Indicators Dashboard, the Northeastern Forest Health Atlas, Northeastern Regeneration Data Network, uh, these are tools that you can dive into to whatever level you're interested in, but the goal is always to provide um, information as quickly as possible to you as a user. So we invite any feedback. Please do get in touch if there's something that you are needing but are missing from these projects, but also if you want any more information, happy to provide more details on how these are built or how you can utilize them for a specific purpose. So with that, I want to thank you for your time and turn it back over to Josh for any questions that we might have. That's great. Thanks, Jim. Really appreciate that. And the uh, the sneak peek into the, the region um, component is particularly interesting. And um, if folks are interested in regeneration talks, uh, just so happens that next week our webinar on Wednesday is all about deer to browse and regeneration and the intersection with hunting um, and we'll have a presentation by Andrea Shortsleeve from Vermont Fish and Wildlife about that. Um, we did get some questions here. Uh, right now I'm looking at a, a number for John so um, let me go ahead and ask you those John. Uh, first and foremost I, I think I had this one right but I just wanted to clarify for everybody that um, everything you presented there, um, all the tools that you can use within events, that that's all available through the free version of the application. Is that right? Mm, you can do most of those things. There's a few that, with respect to exporting it out, um, uh, are on the, the pro and plus versions, but most of it, yeah, pinpoints, tracking, um, mo uh, Taking areas, I believe, might be a plus feature, not a not a free one, but you can do perimeters and the majority. I'd say like 95% of what I covered, you can do in free. Okay, so that that actually dovetails nicely into um, a couple of the questions here, which were: um, Can the tracks be exported as a shape file, and how do you get that onto your computer? Is it the same method as using a GPS? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, yes, you can export it as a shapefile. That might be specific to the the plus version again, but if not, you can do it as a KML file for Google Earth for on the free version, I'm pretty sure. And the way I've found to do that is when you click the info for your layer file or your, uh, your track, I should say, there is an option to export it. And in my case, I usually export it to OneDrive. And once it's on OneDrive, it's on my computer and I can open it up in Avenza or in uh, GIS, sorry. Getting my apps mixed up here. That's great, thanks, John. Yeah. Um, so uh, another couple questions about functionality here is um, a question came in, do you need to download a base map in order to use this or is that already within the app and can you airdrop actual PDF base maps or um, just the features? 
Uh, so to the second question, yes, you can you can airdrop a PDF map if you already have it in Avenza. So uh, you can either just export the map alone or the, the features on the map alone. If the other person already has, say, the base map, you can export just the, the pins or you can do it the other way around. So you can do that. Um, and then, I'm sorry, what was the first part? I'm sorry. The first part was, um, do you need to download a base map in order to use Avenza, yeah. or does it come with one already? Yeah, so um, it needs to be, you need to download a map on cell service or Wi-Fi in order to function. It's not like Google Earth or Google Maps, say, where you just turn it on and there's a map there. But like I said, within the Avenza app, they have their own little map store, and there are free maps available there, such as all of those US GS seven and a half minute maps or whatever they're called that you can just see what area you're on, uh, it, the map, when you download it, will tell you if you're on the map or not. So if you say, I'm here in Richmond, but I pick a map for uh, New Hampshire, it's going to tell me I'm not on the map. So it won't just drop me there. But yes, you need to download a map first. Great. Thank you, John. Yep. Um, we had a couple questions about the, the accuracy of Avenza uh, compared to a GPS unit and mm -hmm. um, how that works and how does Canopy Cover impact that? So in my experience with it, the accuracy that I've gotten with Avenza for what I've been doing has been pretty much equivalent to a handheld GPS. But at the same time, there have been certain moments where Avenza will let you know if it's not getting good um, coverage pretty much of the satellite in the canopy. And that, I have had that happen before. And basically what happens is your blue dot will then have like a slightly faded blue halo around it that will show that you're in the middle of this estimated area right now. This is as close as we can triangulate it. Um, that could be, you know, if you're in a cave, it's going to be huge. It's going to, you know, have like a hundred foot halo around you. But most of the time it's only been, you know, a 10 foot radius in any direction that it's telling me I'm off by. And what I've found to improve that is you kind of, we used to call it like the Trimble Shuffle or something like that when I worked at my last place because it was more of a problem with those. But basically when you're trying to get exactly over a specific point, you take a few steps, you maybe put the phone on your head if you really want to make sure you're getting the best uh, location. You wait two or three seconds and do a 360. And if you're still over your dot, then it's as good as you're going to get. Um, with respect to if it's a 30 foot accuracy or a, a 0.2 foot accuracy. I don't know the exact number, but um, like I said, I, I wouldn't use it to specifically lay out a property boundary survey grade, but it's going to get you pretty close to where you are. And I would say just as accurate or slightly less accurate, but not anything significantly different than a handheld. That's great. Thanks, John. Yeah. Um, so one other thing that came in here is a question about importing the UVA map into Avenza. I'd imagine that's just the same as um, getting any other base map in, into the unit, but maybe you can talk about what that process is like. Yeah, so for a UVA map, you can definitely export it into Avenza. And I've actually had to do this once or twice for checking on someone's property who thinks they might have Emerald Ash for or something like that. And, but the thing is, the map you make has to be a georeference PDF or a georeference TIFF file. Those are the two. So um, if you have a hand-drawn map that shows the property and you just scan it and then try and put it on Avenza, it's not going to work. But if you're making a map in ArcGIS or ArcMap and you export it as a PDF, then you can throw that into Avenza and that'll work for you. And it'll have all your stand boundaries. You'll have your your home that you're not harvesting near. All, all of those things will be there. And um, it, it, it's incredibly useful. I can see this as a, if you're say a county forester or some a forester who's going out and writing these UVA plans, being able to put those maps on your phone is, is a godsend. So um, pretty straightforward process. It's basically just, if you have, uh, say you have one drive or some storage capacity for uh, a map on your phone, all you're gonna do is uh, find that PDF file, uh, select it and when you get the option to open in and select the app avenza should be right there for pdfs or if you're in avenza you can import it in that way there should be a plus icon in the top corner and you can say add map from storage or something to that effect and you can go through your files and find that pdf map or that geo reference tiff and with that if you will if you're trying to make a map very quickly on our a and r atlas website which is free to the public everyone can access and has some layer files you can make a geo reference tiff file and save it to your phone and then uh, you can use that to navigate. I've done that before too. 
Great, thanks, John. I'll, I'll add one small um, addition to that, is that if you are using the free version of Avenza, um, mm -hmm. and you do have that limit of three maps, you'll need to delete one of those maps first before yeah. um, adding the next one. But um, it, it'll make that pretty obvious when you try and add the next one. Um, yeah, thanks, John. Uh, yep. I've got a question for Jim here. Uh, Jim, the question is, do research groups send their newest articles and research studies to be included in the Atlas, or does FEMC track new studies and add their data? So we are generally tracking um, our uh, contributions to the data archive. So what's shown on there is actually pulling from what's in the FEMC data archive. So as more content's added that's relevant, we kind of sort through it on a regular basis and push those studies over to the Atlas. Uh, but we also would welcome uh, researchers reaching out to us saying, I've got this study that should be shown up there as well. Um, so that's a, a feature that, or a component where it's a little bit of both, basically. We do a lot of effort to try and collate all this information. So when we see something that fits well with the Atlas, we're going to throw it up there. We do have the requirement of being able to share the field study locations, which is a barrier to some researchers. Um, but if they can share the least approximate location of their field sites, then we can add that to the Atlas easily. Great, thanks, Jim. I'm not seeing any more questions rolling in here. Um, so I'll wait a couple minutes here to, to close it all out here. But um, in the meantime, I, I do want to give another special thanks to, to Jim and John for presenting these uh, these PowerPoint presentations today on, on tools that you can use. Uh, it's quite a challenge to convert what we had hoped originally was going to be an interactive session using phones, um, clicking through some of the tools that FEMC has prepared, that kind of thing in, in real time. Um, so a special thanks for converting those kinds of talks into something that can be shared over a webinar to both of them. Um, let's see, so as you're leaving the webinar today, remember to fill out that survey if you're looking for credits. Um, and next week, as I mentioned, will be our, our final webinar presentation actually on regeneration and deer browse. Um, we will have an announcement for that today uh, to allow you to register for, for that webinar. Uh, again, that'll be Wednesday at 9 a.m. next week. Um, and in addition to that, uh, I will be sending out that email with some more instructions and details about the on-demand webinar function and, and ability to get credits, um, hopefully starting on May 15th. So look for both those in your inbox today. Um, as I'm saying all that, one more question came in here. Uh, this is for Jim. Does FEMC know of planning commissions or advocacy groups that have used their atlas or data to make decisions? Uh, the So with these tools in particular, uh, the indicators dashboard is one where we've done a little bit more of an aggressive push with those groups. Um, so we have presented to the regional planning commissions as a, a tool. I think the biggest feedback we've heard is that the lack of regionalization, so the inability to dive down to a specific RPC is a challenge. Um, but that said, it has provided kind of context for some of those discussions. Um, so it's not that the indicator dashboard is going to change a story, but it kind of confirms a bigger picture story that we all like to tell. And I, I kind of think about the acid precipitation story as one where we've had a story success. We see a real uh, significant rise in uh, pH of rain, so we're not seeing the same damage to forests. Um, and being able to show that uh, graphically and quickly is one way that we've worked with our air quality partners to continue to advocate for clean air protections uh, that have kind of helped our forests recover at higher elevations. Um, so these are really these tools are really suit themselves well to people who are kind of doing initial exploration before diving into something more. So it's hard to track those direct one-to-one -one impacts, uh, but we see that kind of uptake as an initial exploration step to be really valuable. And then working with educators has been one area where we've seen a lot of uptake as well. Excellent, thanks, Jim. All right, well, with that, I think I'm gonna call this the end of today's webinar. Thanks everybody for attending. Um, any questions, feel free to shoot me an email and um, we will hopefully see many of you again virtually next Wednesday. And thanks again to Jim Duncan and John Cherico. Have a good day. Thanks, thanks all.
Hi folks, it's Kate for uh, just wanting to check in and let you know that um, if you go ahead and close out of the webinar, uh, the continuing education credit survey should pop up. Thanks everybody for participating today and um, for Josh and, and the team for a great presentation. Um, so go ahead and click out of the webinar. Um, you just click the exit button or go to file, uh, leave webinar, exit, leave webinar um, under the uh, menu for go to webinar. Thanks everybody for participating today and uh, Look forward to next week's presentation. Josh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, and X out myself. Um, so I think there's still a few folks that are signing out now. But um, when you're ready, just go ahead and close down the webinar. Sounds great. Thanks. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Josh. Have a great day. You too.